welcome you to the 2.30 session with Celeste Ng, and this is our collo colloquium session with our um, lovely common read author, Celeste Ng. So Celeste Ng is the author of two novels, Everything I Never Told You and Little Fires Everywhere. Her first novel, Everything I Never Told You, was a New York Times bestseller, um, a New York Times notable book of 2014, Amazon's number one best book of 2014, and named a best book of the year by over a dozen publications. Everything I Never Told You was also the winner of a Massachusetts Book Award and the Asian Pacific American Award for Literature, the L L L ALA's Alex Award and the Medici Book Club Prize, and was a finalist for numerous other awards, including the Ohio Ohioan Award and the John Creasy Dagger Award. Um, it has been translated into over two dozen languages. Celeste's second novel, Little Fires Everywhere, was published by Penguin Press in September 2017, and it is also a New York, New York Times bestseller, Amazon's number two best book, and the best fiction book of 2017, and was named the best book of the year by over 25 publications. It was also the winner of the Goodreads Reader's Choice Award in fiction, and will soon be published abroad in more than 20 countries. The book was recently picked up for a Hulu series starring Reese Witherspoon and Carrie Washington, but perhaps equally important, it was recently selected by Frances Marion's first year composition <laughs> program as their fall optional common read. So many of you have probably read this book. By, um, Celeste grew up in Pittsburgh, um, Pennsylvania, and Shaker Heights, Ohio. She graduated from Harvard University and earned an MFA from the University of Michigan where she won the Hopwood Award. Her fiction and essays have appeared in the New York Times, One Story, The Guardian, Tri-Quarterly, and elsewhere, and she is the recipient of the Pushcart Prize and a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. This colloquium is our time with her and where students mostly guide the conversation, so we do ask students to bring their questions to the author, and just to give you a quick overview, we will begin with a reading by Celeste, and I'll ask a couple questions, but then we'll turn it over to you guys, where you are invited to ask questions and guide the conversation. Um, but before we even get started with the reading, we do ask that you make sure that your phones are turned off, so we can dedicate our time and attention to this um, event. So Celeste, would you like to open with a reading. Hi, can you all hear me? Okay, this is the thing about the mic, because I'm never totally sure if it's in the right place. Um, thank you all so much for coming, and thank you, Frances Marion, for inviting me, and um, thank you for doing the colloquium with me. Um, I know a lot of you have read the book already, so I'm gonna keep the reading part really short, because what I actually like better is taking questions and talking to all of you. Um, so I'm gonna read you a very short little passage. Um, Little Fires Everywhere takes place in a suburb called Shaker Heights, Ohio, which is um, on the east side of Cleveland, and it's actually my hometown where I grew up. Um, it follows two families. One is the Richardsons, who have lived in the town for a long time. They're sort of this apparently picture-perfect nuclear family, mother, father, four kids, four teenagers, and a single mother and her daughter who come from out of town. And the two families kind of get tangled up with each other. Um, the, the kids become friends. Um, the single mom, Mia, who's an artist, um, ends up working for the Richardsons as their sort of housekeeper. Um, and as the novel goes on, you start to find out that Mia, this artist, has some secrets that she's been carrying with her. So I'm going to read you a scene from towards the beginning of the book um, in which a few of the kids, uh, Mia's teenage daughter, Pearl, and one of the Richardson kids, Moody, uh, are on a field trip with their history class. They've gone to the, to the art museum. And they discover um, some things there that sort of start to suggest that Mia has this hidden past that she, that she hasn't been sharing. Um, I think that's all that you need to know to go in here. It was a small room with only a few dozen pieces on the wall, all showing the Virgin with Jesus on her lap. Some were medieval paintings in gilt frames, hardly bigger than CD jewel cases. Some were rough pencil sketches of Renaissance statues. Some were larger than life oil paintings. One was a postmodern collage of photos from celebrity gossip mags. The Virgin had the head of Julia Roberts, Jesus the head of Brad Pitt. 
But the piece that had transfixed Pearl was a photograph, a black and white print, eight by 10, of a woman on a sofa, beaming down at the newborn in her arms. It was unmistakably Mia, it's her mother. But how, Moody began. I don't know, said Pearl. They stared at the photo for some time in silence. Moody, ever practical, began gathering information. The title of the piece, according to the card beside it, was Virgin and Child Number One, 1982. The artist was Pauline Hawthorne. He jotted these down in his notebook. There were no curator comments other than a note that the photo had been lent for the exhibit by the Ellsworth Gallery in Los Angeles. Pearl, on the other hand, focused on the photograph itself. There was her mother, looking a bit younger, a bit thinner, but with the same waifish build, the same high cheekbones and pointed chin. There was the tiny mole just underneath her eye, the scar that slashed like a white thread through her left eyebrow. There were her mother's slender arms, which looked so fragile and bird-like, as if they might snap under too great a weight, but which could carry more than any woman Pearl had ever seen. Even her hair was the same, piled in the same careless bundle right at the crown of her head. Beauty rolled off her in waves, like heat. The very image of her in the photograph seemed to glow. She wasn't looking at the camera. She was focused, totally and utterly absorbed, on the infant before her. On me, Pearl thought. She was sure it was her in the photo. What other baby would her mother be holding? There were no photos of herself as an infant, but she recognized herself in this child, in the bridge of the nose, in the corners of the eyes, in the tight, bald fists she had continued to make into toddlerhood and childhood, which in her concentration, without realizing it, she was making even now. Where had this photo come from? Miss Warren, Mrs. Jacoby said behind her, Mr. Richardson. Pearl and Moody spun around, their faces prickling with heat. If you're both ready to move on, the entire class is waiting for you. And indeed, the entire class was gathered outside, notebooks closed now, dutifully chaperoned by the docent, giggling and whispering as Moody and Pearl emerged. On the bus ride back home, jokes began to circulate about what Moody and Pearl had been doing. Moody turned a deep crimson and slouched down in his seat, pretending not to hear. Pearl gazed out the window, oblivious. She said nothing at all until the bus reached the school and the students began to file out. I want to go back, she said to Moody as they stepped off the bus. And they did that afternoon, persuading Lexi, Moody's older sister, to drive them because there was no good way to get there otherwise, and letting Izzy, who's their younger sister, tag along because the moment she heard Mia and photograph, she insisted on coming with them. Moody, who had done the persuading, hadn't told Lexi what they wanted to see, and when they stepped into the gallery, her mouth fell open. Wow, she said, Pearl, that's your mom. The four of them surveyed the photograph. That's so crazy, Lexi said at last. God, that's so crazy. What's your mom doing in a photo in an art museum? Is she secretly famous? The people in photos aren't famous, Moody put in. The people who take them are. Maybe she was some famous artist muse, like Patti Smith and Robert Mapplethorpe, or Edie Sedgwick and Andy Warhol. Lexi had taken an art history class at the museum the previous summer. Well, let's ask her, she said. We'll just ask her. And they did, as soon as they got home, trooping into the Richardson kitchen, where Mia had just finished dressing a chicken for dinner. Where have you all been, she said as they came in. I got here at five and no one was home. We went to the art museum. Pearl began, and then hesitated. <coughs> Something about this didn't feel right to her, the same uneasy feeling you had when you set your foot on a wobbly step just before it dipped beneath you. Moody and Izzy and Lexi clustered around her. She saw how they must look to her mother, flushed, wide-eyed, curious. Lexi nudged her in the back. Ask her. Ask me what? Mia set the chicken into a casserole dish and went to the sink to wash her hands. And Pearl, with a feeling of stepping off a very high diving board, plunged ahead. There's a photo of you, she blurted out, at the art museum. A photo of you on a couch, holding a baby. Mia's back was still to them, the water rushing over her hands. But all four of the children saw it, a slight stiffening of her posture, as if a string had been tightened. She did not turn around, but kept scrubbing at the gaps between her fingers. 
a photo of me, Pearl, in an art museum, she said, you just mean someone who looks like me. It was you, Lexi said. It was definitely you, with that little dot under your eye and the scar on your eyebrow and everything. Mia touched a knuckle to her brow, as if she'd forgotten the scar existed, and a drop of warm, sudsy water ran down her temple. Then she rinsed her hands and shut off the faucet. I suppose it could have been me, she said. She turned around and began to dry her hands briskly on the dish towel, and to Pearl's chagrin, her mother's face was suddenly stiff and closed in. It was disorienting like seeing a door that had always been open suddenly shut. For a moment, Mia did not look like her mother at all. You know, photographers are always looking for models. Lots of the art students did it. But you remember, Lexi insisted, you were sitting on a couch in a nice apartment and Pearl was on your lap. The photographer was, she turned to Moody. What's her name? Hawthorne, Pauline Hawthorne. Pauline Hawthorne, Lexi repeated as if Mia might not have heard. You must remember it. Mia shook the dish towel out with one quick snap of her wrist. Lexi, I really can't remember all the odd jobs I've done, she said. You know, when you're hard up, you do a lot of things just to try and make ends meet. I wonder if you can imagine what that's like. She turned back to the sink and hung the towel to dry, and Pearl realized she'd gone about this all wrong. She should never have asked her mother like this. In the Richardson kitchen with its granite countertops and its stainless steel fridge and its Italian terracotta tiles, in front of the Richardson kids in their bright, buoyant North Face jackets, especially in front of Lexi, who still had the keys to her explorer dangling from one hand. If she'd waited until they were alone, back at home, in the dim little kitchen, in their half a house on Winslow Road, perched on their mismatched chairs at the one remaining leaf of their salvage table, perhaps her mother would have told her then. Already she saw her mistake. This was a private thing, something that should have been kept between them, and by including the Richardsons, she had breached a barrier that should not have been broken. Now, looking at her mother's set jaw and flat eyes, she knew there was no sense in asking any more questions. We'll stop there. Thank you. And just so the audience knows as, uh, as well, some instructors and students have sent some questions, but also I'm sure you have your own. And even if you sent some to your instructor or you talked about it in class, please do not um, feel as if you cannot ask them yourself because I'll ask a couple, but then I'll turn it over. And thank you so much for that passage. Already the different questions that were coming out to me based upon your selected reading um, were there's a number of them, but I'll, I'll open with the Mia's love of art, and particularly the photography. So it plays a large role in the story, but also in the juxtaposition between the two families and in her character alone. So can you speak to that role of the arts and your decisions related there? Sure, so Mia, who's the single mom that you, you just saw in the scene, uh, is a visual artist. She takes a lot of photographs, um, but she doesn't, I don't think she necessarily thinks of herself as a photographer because what she likes to do is to manipulate the photographs or to manipulate the scene. So she's not just taking pictures, but she'll cut them up or she'll warp the negatives before she makes the print or she, she'll stage things very carefully. Um, and as, as we know, sort of the arts are not the, the most stable of professions, I guess. Is, <laughs> is one way of putting it. Um, and that's one of the things that sets her apart from this community. Um, Shaker Heights is this very stable sort of place. It's very planned out. Um, it's literally a planned community. They figured out where all the roads were gonna go. They figured out where to put the schools so that no kids would have to cross a big street to get to school. Um, they used to, for a long time, decide what color you could paint your house, depending on what style it was. Um, so it's a very um, uh, rule-oriented place. And Mia kind of takes a delight in breaking those rules. That's part of who she is as an artist, but um, she's sort of set up as a contrast to that. Um, the photography came about because I think we tend to think about photographs as being um, evidence. We think of them as being real. So if you see a photo, you're like, okay, I guess that really happened. Um, we think of photographs as being really objective. But the truth is, if any of you, you know, well, everybody takes pictures now with your phone, but like if you've ever tried to take you know, photographs, you know that you're always making a choice about what you're showing, right? Um, if any of you are on Instagram, for example, everybody's life looks great on Instagram. 
right? And this is because you choose to not include the part where your laundry's in a pile on the floor, right? Or you choose to not include this, or you're like, oh, somebody's like, you know, somebody's foot's in the picture, I'm gonna like, here, brush that out. You're always making a choice about what to show. And so I, I made me a photographer because I love that this thing that seems so objective and scientific and theoretically unbiased is actually completely manipulated by the person who's taking the picture. Um, and so that's one of the, the things that, that I play with in the book. And Mia's really interested in using her art to kind of explore those ideas too. Thank you. And, and Pauline Hawthorne came up in your reading, and it also came up in a, a class-related question. So, and this is coming from Dr. Rooks's class. Um, but when you were writing this novel, what was your main reason for including Pauline Hawthorne, and what is her true significance, if any at all? What oh, is her true significance? Well, let me, I'll tell you about her first. Um, so she's, if any of you haven't read the book, she's Pauline's art teacher. Um, Pauline was in art school, and in the book, Pauline Hawthorne is this um, sort of like important woman photographer. Um, she's fictional, but she's sort of a, in a combination of some real photographers who really existed. Um, and she's sort of this role model for Mia. Um, Mia comes from a working class family. Her mom is a nurse. Her father is, is basically like a handyman, repairman. And they weren't thrilled about her going to art school. They were willing to pay for her to go to, you know, some kind of like hotel management or to do something that would give her sort of a stable job, but she didn't, she didn't want to do that. Um, and because they don't really understand her obsession with photography, um, she sort of finds this other mother figure in her teacher, in Pauline Hawthorne. And I think that's something that happens to a lot of people. If, your parents are not necessarily the best people to understand what it is that you want to do, and sometimes you find other people who are your teachers or your aunts or your role models or whoever who can kind of feed that that part of you. Um, so she's she's in there sort of as one of Pauline's goals of, of what her life could be. She's sort of a pattern that that Pauline, that me is sort of like I can maybe I could go in this direction. And to jump off of that too, and you since she was a mother figure, and throughout the story, there's different multifaceted um, <coughs> views of motherhood or mother figures, um, and from some very, and, and even the female body, right? So mm -hmm. thinking of what makes a good mother, or if there's only one path to motherhood, and we get exposed to accidental pregnancies, infertility issues, proper behaviors, et cetera. So can you speak to the threat of motherhood for a little bit? Yeah, uh, if any of you were in the morning session, you heard us sort of talking about this, and uh, Adrian Matika, who's here, was talking about how you, you, he's writing poems, and you write a bunch, and you start to see these common themes emerge, and that's sort of what happens to me. I keep finding myself writing about parenthood, and so I am a parent. Uh, I have an eight-year-old at home. He was five when I was writing this book. but. Um, I'm, I'm in the middle of this sort of weird generational sandwich where my mother is still also alive. Um, so I'm a daughter, but I'm also a mother. And I'm now seeing things in sort of two directions at the same time. Um, and I think when I was a teenager, uh, well into my 20s and 30s also, I, I think I thought I understood um, why my mom did some of the things that she did. Um, and then I, now I kind of realized that I, wasn't, I didn't, couldn't really see things from her point of view. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in that idea of what, what we expect about mothers, because I found out when I got pregnant and then when I had a baby that we expect a lot of things from mothers. Um, <laughs> we have a lot of ideas about exactly what they're supposed to do and who they're supposed to be, um, and those ideas don't get applied evenly. Um, you find out like you're supposed to be doing this and you're supposed to be making your own baby foot and you're only supposed to be breastfeeding, but you're also supposed to put them to bed at an exactly regular time and you're supposed to do all these things. And um, there are a million different ways that you can do this wrong. Like there's basically no, no way to satisfy everybody. Um, and I, I find that so frustrating, but also really interesting about all the ideas that we have about motherhood in particular that's really fraught. Um, and so in this book, there are a lot of mothers um, and then also young women who maybe want to be mothers or maybe don't want to be mothers yet, who are trying to figure out how to navigate that, um, how to navigate all the expectations that people have on them, how they're supposed to act, how they're supposed to be, um, and you know, why did you have kids so young? Why didn't you have kids when you were younger? Now you're too old. Um, they're trying to figure that out. That's just something that I keep coming back to. So, to 
to piggyback off of that and also to bring a question that came up in um, Professor Mann's class. So similarly, um, connected to the motherhood, this fatherhood or perhaps lack of fatherhood or lack of father figures um, seem to be absent um, according to a particular student. So when readers come to that, is there anything that you would say I've been asked this question a couple times. People have said, you know, what, how come you don't talk more about the fathers, and how come this book is so focused on the women, and the male characters are sort of off to the side? And that's a valid point because I think that it's important to have books about fatherhood and about men. In my, you know, what I wanted to write about, I was interested in these questions that affect the women and the moms. And uh, I'll leave the books about the men to others because I don't feel that they're getting short shrift. I don't feel like we're not having <laughs> books about men. Um, you know. We don't, the, we don't get a lot of <coughs> nuanced portraits of moms. There's, you know, there's usually the mom who is the perfect mom, and then there's the mom who's not there. And I wanted to sort of give, give moms and women a chance to be at the center. Um, we start having all the books in the world being about women and focusing on women, and no books being about men, and no books about men or by men ever winning prizes. We can come back and have that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have a number of questions, but I think now is a good point to pause and see if there's any questions out in the audience that you would like to ask. And we'll have mics walking around so um, individuals can hear, but I notice three hands go up immediately up front. So ask about the book or writing or mm -hmm. what kind of yeah. snacks I like to eat when I, whatever you want. <laughs> or heckling, that's fine too. So let's start here. In the book, I know that um, you blended reality with the fiction a lot, mm -hmm. like Shaker Heights is a real place. Um, you mentioned the Clinton case mm -hmm. and Pauline Hawthorne. What made you come about that style of writing? Okay. So, I, I, I don't know, could you all hear in the back? The mic? No. Okay. Uh, so the, the question is sort of that in the book, there's, there's a blend of fact and fiction. Um, Shaker Heights, as I said, is a real place. Uh, I grew up there. A, a number of readers have written to me and, like, honest surprise where they're like, I finished your book and then I Googled it and this place actually exists. Did you know that? I'm like, I did know that. I did. <laughs> um, but also, you know, references some historical events. Um, the the uh, Monica Lewinsky scandal, which now seems so quaint. Um, <laughs> other, other things that happened. Um, but then, of course, the family in the book is fictional. They're not based on a real family. Um, the events of the book are totally fictional. Um, and so the question is sort of how did I come to that? Um, I, I started writing the book because I wanted to write about my hometown. Um, I moved there just before I turned 10, and I stayed there until I went away to college. So I stayed there for most of my adolescence, like my formative teen years. And um, this thing happened to me when I went away to college that I thought that my hometown was just like every, everywhere else. And then I got to college and I realized that actually is not true, that my hometown is actually kind of weird. Um, so for any of you who haven't read the book, uh, Shaker Heights is, was a planned community. It was built in 1912. And these, these two um, weird brothers, about whom I could talk for hours, they're super weird, um, planned out everything about the town. They wanted to create this sort of perfect community. And so they planned everything. Um, and it, it, the, the, it continues to this day. So I told you that you, they used to control what colors you could paint your house, right? Um, even now, if you don't mow your lawn and it gets too tall, the city will come and mow it for you, and then they will give you a bill because they did yard work for you. And so this happened to us a number of times. Like if we went away to visit family, we'd come back and there would be this bill for $150 for having mowed our lawn, and my dad would be mad. Um, uh, there are other things like um, on garbage day, usually you put your garbage in the garbage can and you put that out on the curb, right? And the garbage can comes and picks it up, or maybe you take it to the dump yourself. Uh, in Shaker Heights, you can't do that um, because if you put the garbage on the street, it makes the street look too messy. You can't let the, can't ever let it look messy. So you keep the garbage in the back of your house, and the city has a fleet of tiny little garbage trucks. So just picture a golf cart with like a little garbage bin on the back that drives really fast, and it goes down every single person's driveway, picks up the garbage in the back, and then takes it out to the garbage can in the front. So there's never garbage on the street, um, even in garbage cans. Um, and so I thought this was totally normal until I went to college and everyone said, you, you do what now? And why? Um, but the city is very committed to this. Um, 
in 2008, when the recession hit, uh, Ohio was hit very badly. This was a lot in the Rust Belt. Um, the city was sort of looking for ways to cut, cut spending, and they said, you know, maybe we could do without the little garbage carts. Maybe we could get rid of those and just have people put their garbage on the curb, like everyone else in the country does. And the city, the residents overwhelmingly said, no, no, we cannot put our garbage on the curb. So there's something that seemed really um, sort of metaphorically rich to me about that, that like everybody makes garbage, right? But for some reason in Shaker Heights, we think that we've got to hide it in the back. We're just going to pretend that we don't have any garbage. Um, so I, to give, I promise I am answering the question. Um, there is something about that, that after I've been away for a while, I could see my hometown more clearly. I could see all the stuff about it that uh, was weird, that I had thought was totally normal. But then I could also see the things about it that I really loved. Um, was really committed to talking about race in a way that a lot of places that I've been in haven't. Um, there was a race relations group at the high school, and it was like the cool club to be in. And the high schoolers would go and talk to fifth and sixth graders about race. And we'd say like, okay, well, what is a prejudice? And how do these things form and how do we combat them? Um, we talked about sort of like peer pressure and all those things, and I, I also thought that was normal until I got to college and people said, you had a race relations group at your high school? We don't even have one of these at the college. Right? Um, and so I wanted to try and write about this real place. So that's where the real part comes in. But I also, I didn't, I didn't have a story. And I needed to come up with these fictional characters in order to make a story. So I made this family that seemed like, you know, who would be the city embodied as people? And that's how the Richardsons came to be. And then I thought, who would come in and really shake things up for them? Because that's what you do as a writer. You get your characters in trouble. And so that's where the single mother and her daughter came in. And I put them into this real life setting, and I kind of wound them up, and I let them go. And that's how it came about. There'll be a second book. Will there be a second book? I don't, uh, right now, everything that I know about these families is in the book. I promise I'm not holding out on you. Um, but, you know, never say never. Maybe they'll come back to me. Um, we have some questions here? <coughs> Hey, um, when I was reading the book, I kind of felt like there was, like I could kind of feel you into the, the book, like relate to it. And I was wondering if there was like one specific character that you kind of relate to you as while you were living in Sacred Heart. Oh, um, that's a great question. Did, did you all hear this in the back? The I was like, I cannot, because up here it sounds just like normal speaking, <laughs> and I can't believe you all can hear me in the back. But. Um, I'm so glad that you felt like you were relating to the characters in the book. Um, there's a little bit of me in all these characters. Um, you've got the two moms who seem like they're opposites, but they're really sort of flip sides of the same coin. They're really flip sides of me, honestly. Just that I'm really like, I'm a goody two shoes rule follower in a lot of ways, and then I also really like to stir up trouble. Um, and so those are sort of the two parts of me. Um, likewise, there's a lot of teenagers in the book, and you know, Lexi is the oldest. She's kind of the cool girl that I wanted to be and was definitely not when I was in high school. Um, Trip is the kind of cool boy who I wanted to date in high school, but really I was much more like the younger children, the kind of dorky, nerdy ones. Um, but Izzy, who's the youngest child and who um, you learn at the beginning of the book has, has set her family's house on fire and then run away, um, is somebody who was really fun to write because she did a lot of the things that I thought about doing but did not. Uh, <laughs> most, most of them did not do, I did not do most of them um, when I was there. So she was, she's a sort of fun character to do because we don't, everybody thinks about doing something really radical but we don't often get to do it and I got to do it in fiction at least, which was fun. Do you have a question behind? Yeah, did, did you have a question? Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Can you talk, uh, we, we haven't, we, we've touched on the morning session on how race plays into your works and that personal and political intersection, mm -hmm. but uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the question with the adoption, which we haven't really touched on, the, the, the yeah. conflict between Mei Ling and uh, Mirabelle, how yeah. that, um, you know, I'm not asking you to take sides, but um, which, you know, sort of how, how you explored that conflict. Sure. So I, I've told you about the two families that come in and sort of how they get entangled. And um, 
soon after Mia and her daughter moved to town, the town is sort of split in this custody battle. There's been a Chinese American baby who's been left at a fire station. And she's getting adopted by this white couple who haven't been able to have children. And the birth mother comes back and wants to get her baby back. And this leads the town to kind of choose sides in a lot of ways. Um, I find myself reading about race a lot because as a non-white person, this is something that's a big part of my life. And it's something that I, I feel like we need to sort of think about and talk about. Um, and in my first novel, I was writing about it very much sort of from an Asian American perspective. And in this case, I wanted to write about it sort of from the outside in. Um, most of the main characters in the book are white. But um, when we talk about race, we're often talking about it in terms of black and white in this country. That's how we tend to think about it. And that isn't an experience that I feel like I wanted to, I don't want to speak for other people. But I did want to talk about how it can feel a little bit to be sort of in this weird third party of having an Asian. Um, and it gets very complicated as soon as you start mixing adoption and race and childhood into that because there's so much at stake for this baby. Um, and there's a lot of uh, paternalism that happens, especially if you see um, you know, children of color being adopted by white families. Um, so I'm a child of the 80s, so there was a lot of this like, oh, we're gonna save them and give them a better life. And you, you think a lot about what they're also going to lose. Um, just, the, it's a complicated question. And it was one that I didn't wanna provide answers for because I don't think I have them. But I wanted to raise these questions, just for people to think about, like, you know, the child is going to get something if she goes with this family, but she's going to lose something as well. If she goes to this family, she will get something different, but she will lose something different. And just to sort of look at how complicated that is. Um, that's, that's kind of how it came in. Will there be a sequel to Little like, Fires Everywhere? Okay, oh, where you are. Hi. Hi. Oh, oh, you're trying to right Will there be a sequel? Um, <clears throat> Right now, I don't know. I mean, I think I know, I have an idea of where the characters are. Um, I think there's something to be said for, like, I love a sequel as much as the next person. Because I think when you, you are in a world, you don't, you want there to just be more, right? Um, you want another season of whatever your favorite show is. But I think there's something to be said also for sort of knowing when to stop the story. Um, I think about fiction and a storyline is sort of like if you watch a ball getting thrown, for example, or if you're like, I'm a baseball fan, so if you, you see someone hit a, you know, like a ball really far out, at a certain part, point you see the arc and you know where it's gonna land, and that's the exciting part, is seeing it get hit and start flying out. You don't necessarily need to see where it lands. Um, and so a lot of people have asked me, uh, without giving anything away, sort of what, what happens to some of the characters at the end of the book. And I have ideas about where they might be, but for me, I sort of want to stop the story here and kind of let you continue it. So not right now is the short answer. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, earlier, y'all were talking about like themes and motifs in the book, and um, <clears throat> I'm I'm in uh, Dr. Hill's creative writing class, and because of my major, like I've seen so many different, you know, themes and stuff throughout the literature I've read. I find myself getting really boxed in trying not to be cliche. So do you have any like creative writing tactics to kind of overcome um, that issue? This is a great, that's a great question. Um, sort of about how do, you, how do you avoid being boxed in? Um, it's something that I think about a lot, um, have thought about a lot uh, because I'm an Asian woman. Um, I knew as I started writing, uh, people would always say, oh, so you want to be the next Amy Tan? And I'm like, well, no, because my life is really different from her life, and I'm really glad that her, her books are out there, but I also want to do something different. And also, I don't want to be the next her, because I would still like her to be around. I don't need to displace her, but we have this idea a lot of times that there, there can only be like one of it, right? So like, if you, you got like one Toni Morrison, and if you're gonna have another, you're gonna be the next Toni Morrison, something has to, like, she has to like knock Toni Morrison off the pedestal. There's always this idea, I think, that there, there's like this one story. Um, the writer uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie uh, did a TED Talk, actually, which if any of you haven't seen it, like go Google, Google it, it's called the, um, the, the dangers of a single story, where she talks about how dangerous it is to assume that like there can be one person who can speak for all these things. And so like as you start thinking about themes, it becomes really easy for people to sort of put you in like a pigeonhole and say like, okay, you're only you so you write about like Asian people, you write about mothers, or you can only write about the thing that you know about. 
Um, and I think the truth is that like you have to write about what you want to write about. Um, don't try, you know, for any of you who are aspiring writers or who are writers out there, um, try as hard as it is to not think about the, the big picture theme of what you're writing about. For me, if I think I'm going to write a story about the, you know, the difficulties of motherhood, you know, I realize I said I did that earlier, but when I, you know, when I start writing, I'm not writing about motherhood. I'm writing about like these three people. And then you start to see the theme come out of that. If it comes out organically, you know, that's when the story will feel real. And I think like whatever you're writing about, write what feels important to you, write what you need to write. And even if you're writing about a theme that millions of other people have written about, it's gonna be different because it is your book. Nobody else is gonna write the same book that you're writing. Um, and I think that it's, it's just a matter of kind of writing as clearly as you can what it is that you're thinking and feeling. This, this might be related to that question, which is, uh, uh, I don't know, how do you think about the question... Because I can't hear you in the back if you don't like yourself. How do you think about the question of style? in your work, and maybe even thinking about transition from the first to second book, or, or the idea of voice oh, in, terms of, um, uh, in terms of craft? Honestly, I try not to think about it. I mean, I guess if any of you, is anybody here who's a musician in any way? No, I was gonna say if none of you are musicians. I feel like you have, you develop a certain style of your own, right? But it's, you're not necessarily consciously doing it, or maybe you are, and you're picking different influences. Um, I started off wanting to be a poet. Um, when I was a kid, I thought I was going to be a poet. And then my poems kept getting longer and longer <laughs> and more narrative. And I realized that maybe this, <laughs> that maybe fiction was a better genre for me because um, I really I wanted to tell stories. And it, fiction is good at telling stories. Um, but I think that for me, this, this style comes really from sort of reading a lot. Um, and reading people that I loved and then wholeheartedly like imitating them and That's kind of how you you home in on what your own voice is going to be um, There's I don't think there's a shortcut to doing it. It sort of just comes out of you naturally much as your own Voice does you can change it a little bit, but to a certain extent. It's going to be who you are um, And I think that you develop that really by just trying a lot of different things out and seeing what feels natural to you. At a certain point, you figure out sort of what feels authentic to you. It's not a very good answer, I apologize, but it's, um, I think style's so idiosyncratic that it's really hard to, you know when you're imitating someone else, you know like, that you feel like you're doing a bad impression of somebody, um, and when you don't feel like that, that's sort of your comfort zone. Yes, uh, your first book was extremely successful. So how did the success of your first book influence the writing of your second? Oh, well, my first book, I, I wrote it, I, I spent six years working on it. Um, I didn't really know if it was going to be published. Um, I thought I was writing a really small, little, very literary domestic novel about some Asian people that nobody was really going to want to read. Um, and so I was really delighted and surprised when people really sort of responded to it. Um, and I was really uh, freaked out, honestly, because it, it's like the dream that you have as a writer that lots of people will read your book, but it's also really unnerving. Um, it's sort of like if you have a dream and you come down to the breakfast table and you haven't said anything to anybody about it and then people start asking you about the things that happened in your dream, you're like, how did you know about that? Did I say something? And when I first started getting reviews and hearing from readers, I said to my husband, like, the book is out there, and like people are reading it, and he's like, that is the idea uh, with publishing a book. Like, that is what is supposed to happen. But it's a very weird transition when this thing that's been in your head is suddenly out there for anybody to read and comment and make meaning of. And that's what's supposed to happen, but it's freaky. And so when I started to write the second book, it was really hard to kind of um, like turn down those voices in my head because I had these people who had, who had loved the first book, and I didn't want to disappoint them. 
but at the same time, like this was going to be a different book. Um, and so I tried while I was writing it to not think about those things, but also to kind of keep in mind, like I tried to think about it as encouragement, as people going like, yeah, we like you, we're going to, let's see what you do next. Um, that was my way of tricking myself into writing the second book, basically. Okay, I'll answer the question without, without giving too many spoilers. So the question is, so how did I, when I started the book and in writing Little Fires Everywhere and then ended the book, um, how did I sort of know how to, how to frame sort of the beginning and the ending? Um, I knew the book was going to start with a fire, and this doesn't give anything away for those of you who haven't read it. Um, it's pretty obvious from the title. <laughs> but it's also in the first paragraph, um, the, ho the house burns down. Um, and I knew the book was going to start that way. So when I start writing a story, um, it's... It's for me, it's a little bit like planning out a road trip. Like I know where I'm starting and I, I think I'm going over there, like that's my goal. And I have an idea of how I might get there, but I might wander off the path in some way. And so I knew it started with a house fire and my job was to figure out how we got to the fire. Um, and so as I started writing the book and I started writing these characters, um, this is where writers start to sound like crazy people, but you, you start to, the characters start to kind of clue you in about what's gonna happen. And so at the end, um, one of these, uh, one character leaves some significant things behind. Um, and I knew that that was gonna be sort of a message that she was sending to the other characters. Um, so I did, in this case, know the beginning and the end, and my point, my, my job was to figure out how you got from point A to point B. Yes, in the back. How do you approach revisions? Uh, with a lot of fear, honestly. Um, there are some people who love revision. I do not love revision. <laughs> um, but what I do is I, um, I take the first draft as just figuring out what it is that I'm saying. Like, what is the story? I don't always, like I said, I don't always know exactly what the story is going to be. And so I will write a very messy draft. Um, somebody came up to me in the morning session to ask a question about this. And I confess that when I wrote the book, I just let it kind of run wherever it went, and I even cheated, and I told myself, this isn't even a first draft, this is a zeroth draft, like, it does not even count. Um, and after I have that, it's easier than to look at it and go, oh, okay, this is actually what the story is. This is what I'm trying to write about, this is what I'm interested in. This other crap can go away. I don't care about that, but these are the things that I want to keep. Um, so for me, revision is a, project, is a project of just kind of like looking at what actually belongs in the story and like weeding out everything that doesn't belong. Um, and so I go through usually a number of drafts. Um, I'll write it, and then I'll actually make an outline of what I wrote and write down just what happens in every scene. And a lot of times what happens is then you find out that in like four or five scenes in a row, like nothing really is happening, you take those out. Um, and then you figure out how to string everything else together. But it's, it's sort of a process of just going through it over and over until all the pieces fit together. that all the way through the middle, you run through the rest of the alphabet. <laughs> you, you've got 15 to 20 or so characters that you explore. You have cross-generational relationships. There are plot lines intertwined. And each character is limited in their knowledge, their information, and their own perceptions. But somehow, you manage to keep it all straight. I want to know how you do it. I, I would like to know how I did that too because I'm now at the stage where my agent and my editor are like, so, what are you doing right now? Are you writing another book? I see you're spending a lot of time on Twitter. Like, they're, they're starting to nudge me and I'm trying to figure out how, I, I kind of don't remember how I did it and this is the thing that I'm learning. Um, I've now written two books, and you'd think that would mean that you, you know, I would have some idea how to do it. Um, I'm finding that what I did in the first two books does not necessarily teach me how to write the next book. Um, what I ended up doing really is I always go back to character. Um, for me, the story always comes out of the characters, and so I get to know the characters like they are people that you would meet at a cocktail party. So you're like, okay, what's your name? Where do you live? What do you do for your job? You know. Um, then you start asking them other questions, like, okay, well, what kind of TV shows do you watch? Do you watch this? Do you watch that? Are you into Game of Thrones? Are you into The Good Place? Would you watch? you watch Atlanta? 
And then you start asking them more questions where you start getting to know them on a deeper level. Like, you know, oh, where'd you grow up? Did you like it there? Like, you know, um, how, do you have brothers and sisters? Are you close with them? Oh, you're not close with your brother. Why aren't you close with your brother? And you start to learn a lot about who they are. And, you know, you know when you meet somebody, as, as you know part of their life, you can kind of tell what they would do in a certain situation, somebody that you know really well. And so once I know the characters sort of like that, um, I can kind of figure out what their hang-ups are, what their issues are, and that's where their storylines come from. Um, do and you so, like diagrams or sketches? Or uh, I do a lot of things that sometimes don't actually end up working well. Um, at one point I had, a, the, in my apartment, the previous owner had made this cork board that was like one foot tall and like the entire length of the room, and I don't know what this is for. But I had index cards up where I had a, an index card for each scene and they were all beautifully color coded. Um, each character got a different color. This was for my first novel. And then I had them arranged in different order and then I had this string that was connecting them and at a certain point it became this like beautiful mind kind of crazy person mess. <laughs> um, sometimes I do that, uh, sometimes I will do a diagram. A lot of times I just sit there and I think about the characters. Um, these days I'm spending a lot of times on airplanes and in airports and I play games on my phone and then I think about what the characters are doing. I mean, this is a very prosaic answer, but I'm being totally honest. <laughs> um, but a lot of it, in some ways, at a certain point, I think that, um, we were talking about this earlier, at a certain point, the project starts to get its own momentum. Um, you know enough about the characters, you know enough about what happens that it's almost like a ball rolling downhill. Um, it, one of my professors said that the book, at a certain point, starts to teach you how to write it. Um, he says the book becomes a collaborator um, in itself. And so it'll start saying to you, like, when you realize that you need a fireman in chapter eight, it reminds you about the fireman that you had in chapter two. And you're like, oh, right, I can put him in there. And then it'll, you know, you get to a point where you're like, who's going to drive her to her doctor's appointment? You're like, oh, I know who can drive her. This person will drive her. And so what ends up looking like this beautifully woven thing a lot of times is sort of the book giving you clues about how to write itself. Um, I don't sit down and plan out from the beginning, but at a certain point, you're like, what, I've got enough pieces here, I'm, I'm going to use them. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I like <laughs> so I was doing research for another class about like book writing software, so I was just wondering if you actually used it or did you just like use Word or something? Oh, um, in my first book my first book I wrote just like in like regular old Microsoft Word, um, it, which is fine, I love Microsoft Word, but it was really hard because I, like, I would write each chapter in a different file and then when I needed to go back and find out what happened in the previous chapter, I'd have to like go through all my files and like find the right one and search for the right page. Um, now I use a program called Scrivener, which is great. Um, any of you who don't want to pay the hundred and something dollars for Microsoft Word, Scrivener is like 35 bucks. Um, and it's basically this word processing program, but you can move pieces around much easier. And so I use that now. But I mean, whether you write on paper, whether you write in the computer, whatever it is that you write with, um, I think the real work you're doing is the thinking part. And the tool, just do whatever helps you get it down on the paper. Okay, so in my English class, we kept like talking about who would start the fire because we knew who did it in the beginning, but we were thinking maybe there was a possibility of someone else in the end. Did you consider anyone different besides who actually did? <laughs> I didn't, you know. I so I'm in a writing I'm in a writing group um, in Boston, and when I gave them the first pages of the book, which are pretty much the same first pages that are in here now. Um, they were really interested in this question of maybe, you know, somebody else set the fire. And it had never crossed my mind that somebody else might set this fire. <laughs> um, and for me, it was so obvious that she would do it. But I think that speaks to sort of our, our what we expect um, out of books. Like, we expect there to be like, oh, this person was framed, right? Whereas for me, the question is, the interesting question is never, like, who done it, but always, like, why they did it. Um, and so I wanted to sort of put my cards out on the table and be like, here's the fire, this is going to happen, here's the person who said it, and now we're going to loop back and, and find out who did it. Um, I can think of reasons that other people would set the fire, but Izzy, this character, is a particularly loose cannon, and so it was just a delight to let her set the house on fire. <laughs> 
Did I have a favorite character? Um, Izzy, this, this girl was really fun to write again because they're all the th things that you think and you don't say them because we're trained to be polite. Um, especially, I think, a lot of times if you're a woman, uh, you are trained to not say those things. And it was really fun to let her say those things um, and let sparks fly. Um, Mia was also a really fun character because she got to make this art. Um, I always wanted to be a visual artist, and I don't really have the talent for it. Um, but I got to make up her art in the book. Um, I didn't know a lot about photography before I started. I, I like art history. Um, my dad was a like hobby photographer, um, and he had tried to teach me about taking pictures before he died, and I kind of didn't pay attention. And so now, after I've learned all this about photography, I have some of his old cameras, and so I'm going back and teaching myself to shoot on film to try and learn, so I'm kind of doing it backwards. But so Mia was fun to write because she got to make this art that I don't think I could ever make in a <coughs> physical form. Is there a relationship between the scarlet letter and the characters? I love this question, question, which of course comes from like the English department. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I really consciously wanted to name, so that Mia's daughter's named Pearl. Um, if any of you, has anybody here read the scarlet letter? You were forced to read it in high school? Yeah, like I was too. Um, so I, I named her Pearl after the daughter in the scarlet letter, and it's actually referenced in the book. Like Mia consciously names her after Pearl. Because um, in my reading of that book, this is sort of a book about, again, the judgments that we make about mothers and these sort of double standards that we have for the mothers versus anyone else, like let's say the man who was responsible for her becoming a mother, for example. Um, and this sort of judgment of a town in particular about sort of the moral human failings of a couple people. Um, and that, in my mind, was sort of what this book also was getting into at a certain point in time. She originally wasn't named Pearl. She originally had a different name. And I changed her name, uh, partly for this reference. But this is also about a town that thinks it's got it together. They think they've planned everything out. They think they're perfect. Um, of course, they're not. And yet, they're also sort of passing these judgments. And so I wanted to make that, that little reference in there to the book um, and to sort of nod to a classic. As a follow-up, do you care sharing what the original name was, or is oh, that her, no, it's not a it's not a secret. Her original name was Zoe, and um, early readers said that Izzy and Zoe there were too many Z's, and I mean, so this, these are the prosaic things that fiction writers do sometimes. Sometimes you pick your name because it's got this deep significance, and sometimes you pick it because it doesn't sound like any of the other names in your book, and people were just like, yeah, there's too many Z's, like change change one of their names. And so I changed, I changed her name. And it was early enough in the process that I hadn't thought about her. And so now I'm going to use that name somewhere else. Was Zoe a Salinger? <laughs> Zoe was not a Salinger. Zoe is just a name that I liked. Um, I like the significance of the name. Zoe means life uh, in Greek. And I liked that idea. It seemed like the kind of name that this character would give her daughter. And now I'm just going to save it for something else. So. Yeah, so Mia, okay, again, without giving too much away. Um, she's, the photograph is called Virgin and Child Number One in the section mm -hmm. that I read to you. Um, and Mia really doesn't, she has Pearl, but she doesn't, she doesn't have dates in the book. She doesn't do those things. Um, in my mind, her, her real passion was for her art. Um, and that's another way in which she's kind of set apart from everybody else, like especially if you contrast her with this other mom, Elena Richardson, who's got four kids. She's this almost virginal figure, and she's really, um, she's what I think of as like an, an art monster. Like, she only pays attention to her art, and that's sort of where her passion is. Like, in my mind, she's, that's where all of her energy is, and that's the thing that she cares about the most. Um, that's kind of how it came about. But I, it seemed to fit with my conception of who she was, that she's, a lot of readers have said to me that Mrs. Richardson is so extreme in her rule following, and she is. But a lot of people, I think, miss that Mia is also extreme in her own way. She's so committed to her art that she doesn't pay attention to all the other things that happen. Um, you know, she moves around a lot, um, which is, is really hard on her daughter. And yet she's, she's sacrificing all those things for the sake of her art. I mean, she is, in her own way, as extreme as, as Elena Richardson is. Um, and that's another example of her sort of extremeness. We have time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
ask now, and then we'll and then we'll come back. I, I apologize in advance because this is a question about the adaptation. Okay. Right. So I know obviously novel in terms, but you had mentioned specifically before that most of the characters in this book are white. Yeah. So when it was announced that Carrie Washington was attached, I assumed that she's Mia. She is. Yeah, so, she's going to be Mia. Do you want to speak to how you feel about? Yes, I do because I'm really thrilled about it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so uh, so as you heard at the beginning, um, this is getting adapted into a mini series for Hulu. Uh, Reese Witherspoon is going to play Elena Richardson, who's the suburban mom. And Kerry Washington is going to play Mia, who's the artist. Um, and when they talked to me about this casting as we were going through it, um, I was really thrilled that they thought about Kerry Washington. Um, when I wrote the book, I originally wanted Mia to be a person of color. Um, I had thought about her as being a person of color because it sort of sets her up in a really strong contrast to everything else. Um, a lot of people think that Shaker Heights is a very white place. It actually, when I was living there, it was almost 50-50 black and white. Um, it was like 48, 48, like 4% other, which was like me and my family. <laughs> um, and for contrast, the town to the east of us is like 90% white and 10% black, and the town directly to the south of us was, I think, like 94% black and 6% white. So it's really unusual that this town even is as sort of um, diverse as it is. But when I, I knew that it was going to center around this um, debate over this Asian baby. And I didn't feel that I had the, the right or the ability to write a black woman's experience. Um, I didn't want to make her an, I didn't want to make me an Asian woman because it seems a little too neat, right? If you're fighting over an Asian baby, well, of course, people are going to expect the Asian woman to side with the Asian mother. Um, but I didn't, I didn't think it was my, my right to write a black woman's experience because I don't want to pretend that I know what that's like. And so I wrote Mia as a white woman. Um, and I didn't say anything about her race in the book. Um, and so I was really thrilled when um, Reese's production company said, hey, we have somebody in mind. We gave her the book. She loves it. It's Kerry Washington. And I was thrilled. And I told them, because I hadn't said that before, that I had wanted, I had wanted that dynamic in there. And I don't think I could do it. But I think Kerry Washington can, can bring a black woman's <laughs> experience here. And so I love that they picked up on that and that they're going to bring that in. And that's going to be something different in the TV series. Um, they're going to do a couple other things that are going to be different as well, which I also am really excited about. Um, many of them were things that I couldn't fit into the book. But it's interesting to me that a lot of readers, uh, the question that I'm probably asked the most about this book is people want to know about me as ethnicity. So a lot of people are surprised to hear Kerry Washington is playing them because they're like, I assume that Mia was Asian. Which is interesting to me because her name is Mia Warren. And that to me does not telegraph an Asian woman. And her family and her brother. And, and, yeah, and they, they have names that do not, tell, again, signal, you, you can always tell, but like, there's no indication that they're Asian. And so there's this interesting kind of reading that people, when they see my face and they see my name, they assume that these characters, somebody's in there, in there has to be Asian, so it must be this woman. And they overlook all the evidence to the fact that this, this is not an Asian woman. Um, other people have, have written to me and they said, well, we read this in our book group and some people thought she was white, but other people assumed she had to be black. And is there a reason we were confused? Uh, to which my answer is yes, there is a reason you were confused and I think it will be good for you to think about the reason that you were confused. But it does say something about who we expect. Like if we see a character in here who's wealthy, mm -hmm. suburban, is um, you know working a white collar job as Mrs. Richardson is versus somebody who moves around a lot, has a small old car, is a single mom, the kind of things that we project onto them. Um, I think that's, that's something that people, <laughs> the readers, I was like, it is interesting that you assume that the single mom was a black woman. And I would think about your assumptions there a little bit. Um, it, it's, it's really interesting to me to see how people like kind of overlay their assumptions on without even knowing that they do it. And that's been one of the things that I've enjoyed about the book. If you have a question. Um, why did you have her in the trouble of the situation when you told her about the whole I'm sorry, can you say, say that again louder? Why did you have her in the trouble of the situation when you told her about the story about what happened to her brother? Oh, uh, okay. Why, so the question is, why did I have Pearl be mature about uh, when Mia finally tells her sort of about what their, their family history is like and, and where she came from um, and why they've been moving around. Um, I guess you're right, I didn't think about Pearl being mature. She, she seemed to me like a character who was going to be mature. In a lot of ways, um, she has to kind of act like an adult 
because she's traveling with her single mom. Her mom is not interested in doing a lot of the mom things. And so in a lot of ways, Pearl kind of has to act like an adult. Um, and so it seemed to me like that was a place where that, again, she was going to be mature enough to sort of understand her mom. And I wanted, I wanted that mom and that daughter to kind of understand each other. Um, and her, what you call Pearl's maturity, I think of her as like seeing her mom as like, okay, I understand why you've been doing this thing that's been driving me crazy my entire life. Okay, I see, I see where that came from. Well, thank you all for the wonderful questions you brought and Celeste's conversation. Thank you.